Good day, everyone. My name is Jim McLaughlin. I'm Professor Emeritus of Purdue University, and I have been working for a number of years on video exposure monitoring. This presentation is really brought to you uh, as a means of uh, stimulating discussion, uh, services, and research in the area of combining videography with real-time sensors. I'm happy to share this with the community and uh, of uh, safety and health professionals uh, who are have a passion for improving worker safety and health, and it is my pleasure and honor to present this uh, to you today. So what is video exposure monitoring? Uh, video exposure monitoring synchronizes real-time or near real-time chemical, biological, radiological, and or physical agent data with video recordings of workers and or environmental activities. Uh, the focus of much of my research uh, initially started with NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, uh, to which I took an early retirement from them and started as a professor at Purdue uh, University and uh, developed my lab called the Purdue Exposure Assessment Research Laboratory, where I conducted a number of video exposure monitoring research projects. Many of my students uh, got their master's and Ph.D., uh, degrees uh, in this area. So occupational exposures, uh, one of the reasons I'm very interested uh, in this uh, exposure assessment tool um, is that in traditional industrial hygiene sampling techniques, uh, we're often looking at uh, collecting uh, data over a period of time, averaging that data, and then looking at this information, and if it's above uh, a certain standard or recommended standard, uh, it, their action is to be taken. If it's below it, then there's no action. And it's too simplistic uh, because often what uh, I've found in my research is that anything over a particular standard or recommended standard uh, often results in certain predictable events that are short-term that can be controlled. The video exposure monitoring helps you visualize uh, the task or the events that occur. The real-time sampling, which is usually collecting data second by second, uh, identifies those peak exposures. And this is where the excitement for me uh, comes into play because we can now target uh, those exposures uh, and eliminate them, thereby reducing overall exposures in a much more cost-effective way. So when we look at this particular model and we see the workers and the task and the chemicals and environment and we record this over time, notice that the, the data are not always constant. It varies according to activity uh, or by uh, work practices. And the idea is to go after these peaks and try to eliminate those exposures. So what I've developed so far with uh, video exposure monitoring uh, system is that uh, we can monitor for particulates and for solvents. Uh, we have PIDs uh, for overall uh, measurement of organic uh, compounds, uh, and we tend to use vacutainers to identify uh, what those particular organic compounds are uh, through GC mass spec analysis. We have uh, noise dosimeter monitoring, radiation detectors, uh, infrared detectors, UV uh, detection, heart rate monitoring, and then, of course, uh, the usual uh, temperature, humidity, vapor pressure. And, of course, if we're outside, uh, we can use GPS. If we're inside, uh, we can use uh, RFIDs uh, for tracking movements and where people are in terms of time and place. So uh, NIOSH has uh, started an initiative some years ago, to which I'm part of this committee, where they're looking at prevention through design. That is my uh, position that using video exposure monitoring not only identifies hazards in the workplace, but based on this information, if enough is collected, you can predict what exposures are going to be and design workplaces that eliminate these particular hazards. And I'm pretty excited about the initiative that NIOSH kicked off some years ago in this area, uh, and I predict it's going to be used uh, more and more. Video exposure monitoring uh, would be a, a, a perfect tool uh, toward this end. So the genesis of video exposure monitoring, uh, the tipping point for me, and everyone has their uh, epiphany, if you will, in terms of that magic moment is that you see something and you say, wow, that is something I really want to pursue uh, in my life and, and try to make a difference in, in terms of improving uh, the workplace. And this was it for me some years ago. Uh, we were doing some research, and this was back in 1985. Uh, myself, uh, another researcher, uh, Dr. Mike Grissel, and another one, uh, Dr. Bill Heitbrink, um, were all working together on a particular project. 
in uh, uh, a, a plant that manufactured a number of different uh, products and chemicals. And uh, what we used back then was a handheld aerosol monitor. We had a, an Apple computer uh, to log the airborne dust concentrations. And in those days, uh, a VHS camera to record all those work activities. So, th so these were separate instruments. But the idea at the time was to integrate uh, the, the three instruments in such a way that we could visualize the exposures as a function of work. And this was the uh, the activity. Uh, it was a, a scooping task, and you, it doesn't take a whole lot of rocket scientists to know that when you stick your head down in a drum, you're going to get higher exposures. But that really wasn't the, the element. The idea was that we knew the concentrations would vary as a function of depth in a drum in terms of the scooping task. And so we looked into this uh, uh, aspect, and this is the first video that you'll see. I'm going to show you uh, half a dozen of these videos. And you see at the very beginning this little red line right here which showed you relative exposure. The drum is full, and the bags are being weighed. And then just a few seconds later, uh, we come back. We revisit this now where the drum is about half full. You can see the level is much lower. And watch them open up the bag. Notice the background levels are higher, but watch this just shoot straight up. And there is this huge peak right here. So we know that scooping out of the drum is obviously uh, a major problem in terms of exposure. We also notice that over time, the residual concentrations uh, increased in the, in the work area. So uh, I was uh, still uh, wrapping up my work, my PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, and I had both an industrial hygiene background and now an ergonomics background where I could do uh, assessments of the workplace in terms of breaking the job down into its critical elements. And what I determined is that, one, the job was not efficiently designed in terms of the scooping and weighing task. And number two, there was something here to tell us about controlling those exposures uh, from the dust. And so we modeled the data, and as you can see here, uh, the relative uh, concentration of the dust uh, here on the uh, the, uh, the ordinate and then the abscissa right here going along with bag count. You can notice that uh, we broke the job down into weighing, uh, or the scooping to weighing and to turning. And about bag 35, between 30 and 35, about halfway down at the drum, you notice that the scooping task in terms of the, the dust exposure from the handheld aerosol monitor increases dramatically. So what this presented to me in my epiphany was that, you know, geez, it looks like scooping about down to about halfway down the drum, levels of exposure are fairly well controlled, but after that, they get totally out of control. It also told me that the weighing task and the turning task were not as important as a scooping task, as you might uh, be able to, to do from observation, but the real-time data gave us actually a tipping point, if you will, or a, an, an exact area of concentration of, in terms of how we would control these per processes. So if you did time-weighted average sampling, for example, your, recommendation, your recommendations might be to increase the ventilation, uh, to clean out the ducts, to um, get a, a larger uh, fan, um, to uh, modify the work practices, any number of these things, because these are just generally understood control mechanisms by which you would apply an average exposure. What we did was we actually, based on this information, we simply cut the drum in half uh, because we knew that scooping all the way down to the halfway point wasn't much of an issue. We lined it up in line with the weigh scale right next to it, and then the drum that received the, the bag that had been weighed was dropped here. So we went from about a minute and a half per bag down to about 40 seconds per bag, and we reduced the exposure by over 98%. And it was a significant uh, achievement because, one, it was simply using all the controls that are already in place, uh, yet putting in a half-height drum, weighing it, and putting in line. So we improved productivity and quality. And this was an incentive operation, by the way, so the workers were very happy with improving the layout of this, this particular operation, but also reducing the overall exposures, which means, too, you also have less to clean up and you have higher yield. Uh, by the way, this, uh, this slot exhaust system right here uh, was put in because of the bag dumping activities where we'd cut open a bag and, and pour in uh, the particular contents to be weighed out. And you may be asking yourself, well, why don't you use a screw conveyor or uh, some other uh, system by which you can bring this stuff in without handling it all? The, this particular um, 
facility was a job shop. One day it would be making cables for Trident submarines, and, and, and that's what they really were doing if you see uh, when the work was done in the 80s. Or the next day they might be making wallpaper uh, for a, a hotel. Uh, because it was a job shop, it was just easier to use different bags of material to do the mixing and the banberries and so on. So this, to me, was the big tipping point where we could go from understanding where the problem start to occur uh, and then implement some very simple controls to not only improve productivity but to reduce exposures. And from that point, uh, we moved forward and... and um, were able to uh, make a number of, of, of uh, research projects while at Purdue University uh, to improve worker health, not only in the United States, but around the world. So the next one uh, is, is really a fun project that we got involved with in Cappadocia, uh, Turkey. Um, it's a very exotic place. Uh, the big problem they have there is mesothelioma uh, from an aronite uh, that comes from the ground. It's in the soil. We also have a lot of aronite um, in the United States, uh, especially in the, in the West, uh, Wyoming's, uh, Dakotas, and so on. And the idea was to determine where uh, the aronite uh, concentrations were greatest and why they were, there was such a spike in the mesothelioma. Uh, my uh, working hypothesis was that with Turkey becoming a, a, under NATO um, after the, the Second World War, that they basically went from uh, animal uh, drawn plows and so on to tractors and things and that agitated the soil a lot more became airborne and then we'd see this large cluster of uh, mesothelioma cases uh, throughout the villages uh, but again that was just a working hypothesis I was brought in uh, to use um, my skill to measure uh, the concentrations and the particle sizes to see if there was some predominant particle size that might be uh, the source of, of some of the mesothelioma. So Cappadocia is right here, as you know. We know about uh, what causes uh, uh, the causes of mesothelioma in terms of uh, the agents, uh, the, uh, the type of asbestos and so on, but what is the role of the aronite uh, here? And uh, this is a, a fibrous bundle, the aronite, and so is it, is it the bundle itself or is it the individual fibrils that break off and so on? This was part of the research project. This is the exotic landscape that you can see here with the volcanic tufts in the villages that surrounded these volcanic tufts, and, and often people lived inside of these volcanic tufts for, for centuries. Um, exotic place. So the villagers here mapping out epidemiologic maps of where people were sick or had died and so on and where the testing uh, uh, procedures were, were un being undergone. In addition to that, we look at the uh, relationship of, of genetic predisposition to that between the males and females and the, and, the, and the family trees and how that all played out. Uh, and so we're looking at genetic predisposition as well as uh, exposure profiles. We used the LASAR-2 at the time. Uh, there are obviously more advanced models today, uh, but this measured uh, different sizes, uh, and this is what we had on site. And then this is me. Uh, this is, place was uh, thought to be haunted, and they wouldn't go down inside these caves, and I did. Uh, this is a flash. It was very dark in here when I was doing the study, and it was a little scary at the time, but basically agitating the, the surface, uh, you know, basically simulating work, if you will, to get airborne concentrations. We did it in the homes. We did it in the mosque, uh, and these are the, the, the prayer positions that you can see right here. One of the more interesting things that we found in the study uh, was that the concentrations were highest in the mosque, and a lot of the reason is that even though they, uh, the, when, when those uh, people come to prayer, Muslims come to prayer, um, they take off their shoes, but often they have cuffs uh, in their trousers, and when they would pray, the, a lot of the sand and dirt from the soil outside would come out of the cuffs uh, in their trousers and onto the rug. So you could see where there would be an exposure uh, issue uh, with those coming to prayer. So uh, this is the output right here. And the, the short story is that we found basically this uh, 0.2 micron particle size uh, as being the predominant uh, fiber size in most of the samples that we took. And again, our highest concentrations were found in the mosque. So uh, shipping gears, uh, going from looking at uh, uh, dust particles now to biomonitoring um, and looking at uh, issues of, of uh, cardiovascular uh, um, challenges. Uh, one of the things that uh, we started working on 
some time ago when I was with NIOSH was at the beverage delivery industry and trying to optimize the loads on beverage delivery trucks to reduce uh, cardiovascular load, reduce uh, fatigue, and so on, uh, and uh, resulted in um, OSHA uh, working uh, with uh, Pepsi-Cola at the time uh, to resolve some of these, uh, these challenges, uh, and then it went across the board to Coca-Cola and to others uh, to redesign these side load trucks uh, so that the workers would not experience higher risk for uh, back injury, shoulder injuries, and so on. We also did uh, some initial work uh, looking at um, Navy SEALs, uh, the concept of going into and out of uh, various areas uh, to decrease injuries uh, from um, jumping from one building to another, and I'll show you some quick examples of that. So here's the um, uh, heart rate overlay at the time that we did, and uh, you can see this is where the current heart rate is, and you can see where it's going to trace to go than the green, and here you have a, a delivery worker unloading uh, beverages uh, from the truck. What's nice about this kind of overlay, you can predict where the highest uh, loads are going to be, and you can see you're moving around uh, the uh, the beverages and so on, uh, leveling them, and then when he finally gets it all loaded up and so on, you'll see it'll turn around and go off and deliver these these products inside. Uh, there's a technical report that I put together on the soft drink beverage delivery industry, and as a result of that, there were a number of redesigns uh, that uh, the uh, industry implemented into these trucks to make it uh, easier uh, for the workers to uh, deliver their product and to reduce cardiovascular load. Uh, pretty proud of that work, uh, but it shows you the power of, of using data that you can overlay video with um, cardiovascular load. This next one is uh, the one I was talking about with the training. Uh, this is a parkour, uh, 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 some students uh, showing off their skills, and the idea was a proof of concept uh, for video exposure monitoring to be able to look at not only cardiovascular load, but also infrared imaging. And the idea here is that where you see these lighter uh, patterns, these are heat patterns, and the idea would be to analyze these heat patterns along with the cardiovascular output uh, to look at how well um, uh, the, the soldiers, if you will, uh, uh, could uh, conduct this training in terms of jumping and landing, dissipating the energy, and so on. So let me click on this and um, show you what this looks like. So uh, here we have uh, we have two uh, uh, two uh, students doing this this work, showing that their their movement and moving around and, and their uh, their skills. But notice uh, that we have a nice infrared image here. And we also have, and it's about 12 feet across, by the way. That's a pretty good jump, and it's just a ledge. There's nothing on the other side. So you can see they're running down, and they jump, and they hit, and they roll, dissipating the energy, so on. And they come back. They're going to repeat uh, a little bit of this pattern. You can see now the heat patterns now coming off of, uh, of uh, these, uh, these students. And they jump back down uh, and roll, dissipate. Now they're going to stand and show me their patterns. And right here, not only do we see the cardiovascular uh, differences between the two in terms of output, we also see the heat patterns uh, on the clothes in terms of uh, use of their muscles and so on, which can be used in algorithms to help uh, do better training. So uh, physical infrastructure for those with disabilities, um, did a lot of that work while I was at Purdue. Uh, this is a student who had a brainstem uh, tumor and had it removed and, and lost uh, his ability to walk around. So he was in the cart and we wanted to make Purdue more accessible. And what we did was we put a camera on this cart. And uh, what was fun about this is that the student was also a uh, fellow researcher helping us out. Uh, and here you can see him going along one of the roads. This is just before a football game. And you see these hazards like this, just a car turning right in front of the guy uh, causing problems. Uh, the good news is we went back uh, to uh, the folks at Purdue and talked about a number of the issues that we saw as challenges of students getting around campus with disabilities. And to the letter, uh, they addressed every single one of these in terms of improving the size uh, and accessibility of the curbs and the, and the walkways and so on, uh, but also making it easier for students with disabilities to get around campus um, as a result of this technology. So pretty proud of, uh, of that kind of work in, in terms of making uh, uh, Purdue, but many universities now accessible using this kind of work. 
Um, for healthcare environments, uh, we've used it for anesthetic gases uh, and also radiation and nuclear pharmacies and then volatile solvents in, in pharmacies. Uh, this shows an example. There's a, quite a bit of work I've done in the area of, uh, of waste anesthetic gases. And this is comparing two different systems. Uh, one with uh, is an existing system out there with, and you can see what we're visualizing is nitrous oxide uh, using a, a filter to help us visualize that. And this is the new system over here. And the idea is to show where uh, the system that uh, is, is uh, market available is, is not performing as well as uh, one that's just coming on the market, comparing and contrasting. And what I found is that if you show something like this on a Moran or Sapphire, saying, well, this is a concentration, they say, well, that's interesting. But when you can visualize it and say, well, where is this coming from? You can see there's a lot of back pressure here from patient breathing, uh, overwhelming the mass, so the vacuum system obviously is not uh, up to where it should be, uh, whereas this one's working a little better. But there's some, some coming out, but you can see also the stream uh, in which the um, waste anesthetic gases are coming up and potentially exposing um, uh, the, uh, the dentist and dental assistant. Uh, in pharmacies, we have an interesting one here. And what we, we learned in, in looking at the data is that you can have so much time involved in, in looking at data uh, that it overwhelms you and you really want to get to where are the problems. So uh, we added into our software bookmarks that basically when it went over a certain threshold, uh, that it would bookmark that particular event. So when you see this uh, particular image uh, right here, you can see that uh, this uh, PhD student is constantly touching uh, her face, rubbing her brow, um, in and out of the, the hood. The hood was, uh, you know, under um, controlled exposure. The sash was pulled down, as you can see, and talking. But uh, when you count up the number of times she touches her face, this is around 16 times. You say, my goodness, what is going on here? Uh, as many of you know, that benzene is used as an intermediate uh, for a lot of the um, chemical reactions in the pharmacy industry, and it's a carcinogen. And our concern was, where was this coming from? With real-time monitoring, uh, what happens is that when you bookmark these events and put them in, this is a 45-minute protocol that was shrunk down to about 45 seconds, you can see right away that the issue is she had contaminated gloves. And uh, every time she touched her face and so on, this little profile that you could see right down here would cause a spike. And by putting all those events together in a short amount of time, uh, just by bookmarking a threshold, uh, you immediately can get right at the heart of the problem and say, your issue is not poor ventilation, your issue is not poor work practices in the, in the sense of putting benzene on the counter and bringing it through your breathing zone and so on. Your issue is that you have contaminated gloves and by raising awareness about this, you are causing uh, overexposure every time you bring your gloves close to your face. So that can be modified quite a bit. And it shows you the power of video exposure monitoring when you bring video in with real-time sensing. Uh, we have taken this to the pharmaceutical industry one step further using the internet, the various cameras. We have the, the helmet cam. This came out years ago. Uh, NIOSH has recently started publicizing this kind of stuff. We were about a decade ahead of them uh, on, on this kind of technology. And we also use an area cam uh, and so on. And what was fun about this, we actually uh, were able to transmit to a tablet anywhere in the world uh, in terms of the outcome from these exposures. Um, here it shows uh, some of the software we developed in terms of um, event marking and so on. And uh, here's an area cam where you can see uh, the, the, uh, the pharmaceutical mixing going up into the breathing zone. And here's the event. And you can see it's just so chaotic right here. This is not a work practice issue. This is not a failure of ventilation. This is just a failure of control uh, in terms of this process. But it did show us some nice stuff. And I believe... Get this, oops, try to get this to work for you. Hoping I can. Oops. No. Well, um, anyways, the, uh, maybe, maybe this will work. Here we go. Maybe this is it. No. Sorry about that. So uh, this shows a, a mixing operation, and uh, it shows you in real time all the data coming through. 
This is uh, an area cam showing uh, what the, the work process is, and this is the the, the area was is viewed from the the, uh, the helmet cam, uh, showing the actual worker visualization of the process. So it's uh, quite handy uh, in in helping us determine exposures. And of course, this thing is just a, a chaotic process. Uh, in, in radiation, uh, a lot of it's anthropometry. These are um, lead uh, shield, these are called L blocks. And look at my size versus my PhD student and her size. And part of the problem is, is not only reach, but visualization of this. Uh, and based on our work here, we were able to come back and be able to make this L block adjustable uh, to different size individuals uh, for better visualization uh, So and also for, for reach in terms of um, uh, the uh, width of, of the particular uh, L block. Uh, so uh, from that then, we took our show on the road to New Zealand uh, and uh, very happy to report to you that we actually changed the way a, an industry does business, the woodworking industry. We put them in a box. Um, uh, another uh, company tried to do this. The problem was um, you can't just build it and they will come. Uh, the idea is you build it and you take this to the customer and you show them the value of, of what it is to be able to collect this kind of data uh, and the outcomes from that data. So we put the whole system in, in a box and uh, we went to the woodworking industry, which is mostly uh, small operations. And you can see it uh, right here where the person is uh, cutting and so on. And, and uh, here we have two cameras set up uh, giving us a profile of what the dust exposures are and so on, and evaluation of, of the various controls. And what was nice is that we could collect the data and get all that information. And we were able to get it down to about three different uh, machines, basically a routing machine, a CNC machine, and, and a sander. And uh, we made recommendations on what they could do uh, by decreasing the dust exposures in these, these small uh, sort of family-run operations, 12 to 15 people per operation. And what happened is that uh, while we were pretty excited about the findings and saying that 80% of your problems are related to um, uh, your uh, three or four of the machines uh, in here, uh, we uh, were much more excited about the fact that uh, if they took, took care of those and they could actually download uh, the instructions on what equipment uh, they would order in terms of fans and so on, they could actually make their own downdraft tables and so on. Um, but the truth of it is that after we we basically presented all this information uh, to the owners of these various companies, uh, they thought it was great. Uh, the problem was maintaining these instruments. But what was here was the key take-home point, which I got super excited about, and that is that what their work uh, routine was: they'd come in in the morning, they do all the cutting and so on, they go off to lunch, and they would come back after lunch and they would sweep and clean up. And they couldn't do any of the lacquering or varnishing of, of the, the wood pieces because there was too much dust in the air. When we implemented the controls, we actually reduced those dust concentrations so much that when they came back after lunch, they could begin to lacquer and, and um, put varathane and other coats of material on the wood to begin the next process, thereby doubling their productivity. Uh, in other words, they could do all the cutting and sanding, go for lunch, come back, and now do the second stage of the woodworking process, which is assembly, and to which they could wear uh, the various uh, liquid coats of, 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 of paint and, and lacquer and so on without having problems of, of bringing dust into the equation. When that was uh, shown to the owners of the uh, various uh, facilities uh, making these wood products, that was the game changer for uh, that entire country to which now they not only implement those controls to reduce hazards uh, for the workers, they also have shown it to boost their productivity. And uh, that, was, that was done just a few years ago. So indoor air quality, we did another one at the Echo Sciences Building in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, big problem here uh, uh, with indoor air uh, quality issues. The, the, the major thing was that they turned off all of their uh, circulation about 5, 6 o'clock in the evening, turned it back on at 6 in the morning. And the problem uh, came from certain areas where people were having uh, adverse reactions uh, to in, in various areas of this building uh, to what they did not know. Uh, so we were brought in, and you can see it's a beautiful building, uh, and put uh, things on a cart, 
And we did uh, particulate monitoring, and we did for uh, VOCs. Uh, um, particulate monitoring, we're interested in um, uh, copying machines and so on. And for the VOCs, uh, we would we would stop uh, at where we'd find a peak, and then we would uh, crack open a vacutainer, as you can see down here, do a grab sample, and then offer GC analysis. And uh, this is uh, basically the recording as we go along to show us the peaks and outcomes. Here's the two instruments up here. Uh, and at the end of the day, what we found uh, was that there uh, is an issue. There were several issues um, in terms of people with odors, in terms of uh, uh, drain traps being absent and so on. But uh, we were able to get it back down to uh, the tiles that were glued down and different types of glues that were being used uh, and to multiple chemical uh, sensitivities uh, that some people had developed as a result of exposures who could no longer go back into the building. Um, so this kind of technology really helped uh, the, uh, the, the folks, uh, the, the Brisbane government, uh, as well as the owners of the building, uh, to be able to try to resolve this uh, particular issue uh, for the health and safety of the workers. So um, major industry partner uh, that we've been working with recently is Teleflex. Uh, they are very interested in uh, exposure to waste anesthetic gases in the post anesthetic care unit, where the patient now is the reservoir. Uh, this is after surgery. It turned out um, I poo pooed the idea initially and then found after I took some measurements in there and all the patients that would be wheeled in right after surgery that they are basically significant uh, reservoirs uh, when you add them all up to exposure uh, to um, the nurses in the post anesthetic care unit. And um, uh, we're, we're raising awareness about this particular issue. There is a device, a scavenging system that has been developed to try to address this issue. Uh, and you can find out more information uh, on, that uh, shows you this link on the particular screen. But uh, to my own way of thinking is um, I say, well, if it can be used for waste anesthetic gases, it might be able to be used for a pathogen. Uh, and we're interested in a couple of things. One is using bioluminescence uh, to detect pathogens in healthcare environments. Uh, this shows some, some old stuff about germicidal spray, and actually I think this is some wine that had been rubbed on a chicken. You can see that uh, you know, some bacteria glow. Um, obviously, you've seen a lot of this with fish and so on. And we've applied it in laboratory studies, uh, which we've uh, recently conducted, and uh, have found a tremendous amount using the bioluminescence about not only uh, where it goes uh, from the patient, but how it gets trapped into the scavenging system and how it may be used uh, as a, a significant source of control uh, for um, uh, controlling pathogens in, in healthcare facilities. So where am I going with all of this? Uh, last couple slides here. Uh, I've always had this fantasy uh, about shrinking things down to something that you can wear on your wrist or something you can put in your pocket, uh, the old tricorder from the original uh, uh, Star Trek uh, series. Um, I know that Star Wars has just come out, but the Star Trek series was, was something Thing very impressionable to me that said, uh, you know, is it safe after pushing a button? I certainly want to go in that direction. Uh, my vision is that uh, more and more smartphones uh, will be uh, those devices to capture video images. Um, sensors will be attached to those smart devices. Not only will it tell you where you are and the time of day you're there, but give you automatically that video signal. And that sensor will give you real time output uh, in terms of is it safe? Um, not only can we use this in, in the workplace, we can use this in environmental issues and so on. This has been my passion, my tipping point, as you saw, way back in the 80s where I just had that epiphany of saying, if we can visualize the problem and we can see the changes of data second to second, we can go a long way toward engineering much more effective uh, solutions, much more cost-effective solutions, not only in the workplace, but in the world in general in terms of preserving and protecting public health, the environment, and the workplace. Um, last thing uh, is to uh, uh, tell you that NIOSH has uh, rejoined uh, the community, if you will. Uh, we, as I mentioned early on, my, my uh, colleagues in the 1980s uh, got this whole thing going. And then it showed itself up again. Uh, I presented some of my work in uh, 
in uh, 2002 uh, to this group in Pittsburgh. Uh, and uh, some years later, uh, something that looked very similar has come online uh, to which NIOSH is now promoting, which they call Evade. It's something that you can download. Um, it's uh, for, I've tried it and others have, have, have done it. They say it's a bit clunky right now, but knowing NIOSH, they'll make this improve. It's uh, Right now, I believe it's just for particulates. I think the, the noise element has just come online. They say their focus is in the mining industry, but it doesn't take a, um, a lot of uh, uh, intelligence to know that it can be applied in a number of other uh, industries. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm very pleased to see um, uh, NIOSH getting back into this equation with video exposure monitoring. Uh, we know it's going to be easier. Um, I have a number of things I've already developed, software plugins and so on, uh, that are very useful uh, toward this end and, and far in advance of what the technology is being offered online. Uh, but the fact that the government is spending taxpayer money uh, to invest in protecting worker safety and health using uh, this technology uh, is very significant to me uh, and of, of great value. So uh, with that said, um, I'm, I'm uh, pleased uh, to uh, ent entertain any questions uh, that you might have, uh, and this would be under uh, drmclaughlin.com. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, thank you very much for your time and your attention.